Okay, um, I am Timothy Noah at Politico, and I am speaking today with uh, uh, Wharton uh, Professor Peter Capelli. Great to be with you here today, Peter. Thank you. And we are going to talk about the skills gap. Um, I, uh, uh, I am the labor editor here at Politico, um, and uh, uh, we actually had a panel um, about a month ago where we uh, were hoping to get Peter to talk about this. We had a panel on the skills gap. We were hoping to get Peter, and there was a scheduling difficulty. Uh, but Peter, it felt like you were there anyway because we talked so much about your very interesting study from a year ago uh, oh, okay. for the National Bureau of um, uh, economic research and has that has that subsequently been been published I'm not yeah sure. it's uh, appeared in a journal called the ILR review uh-huh okay um, and uh, really I I, I, I I can't speak highly enough about this it was you know one of those uh, kind of eye-opening um, uh, uh, essays written in plain English which which we lay people uh, appreciate uh, on um, on a, on a, a much-discussed subject and uh, uh, got me thinking a lot uh, about this much-discussed skills gap. And um, uh, if I'm summarizing your thesis correctly, tell me if I am, you are saying that, that uh, uh, just about all of this discussion of the skills gap is, is rubbish. Am I, um, to use a technical economic term, uh, is that is that a, a correct summary of your paper? I I, th I suppose many people would would, <laughs> would read it that way. I think <laughs> uh, I think what I was trying to do was to clear up a lot of confusion. So mm -hmm. and it begins with the fact that people say skills gap and mean lots of different things by that. So a lot of people think they're agreeing, and in fact they're not sure what the other people mean by the phrase skills gap. And there's a lot of leaping to conclusions that have gone on, and then a sense of um, uh, that everybody's on the same page when, in fact, they're you know they're really not. So, it, you know, to, terms, it, could you go through the three terms that you use in the paper uh, um, regarding skills? There's the skills gap, and then uh, uh, there's there's a skills shortage, uh, mm -hmm. and then there's the skills mismatch, and the. <laughs> Skills shortage, I think, is the idea that there's uh, just not enough people with the right skills to do the, the job. And that's kind of a input-output sort of model, what I was calling the Home Depot view of, um, of the workforce. I think I should get some endorsement from Home Depot for, for saying that. But, uh, the idea there is that, uh, you know, jobs have fixed requirements, sort of like... Uh, bolts have fixed sizes for nuts and that only this size nut fits on that bolt and so a worker has to have exactly this set of skills or they can't do the job and um, we know from lots of research that that's simply not true. Um, the skill uh, gap argument is the idea that um, there is something systematically wrong with school leavers, high school or college, that is causing them to not be um, employable, or at least employable in way that we might have expected they would be, or perhaps were in the past. And a skill mismatch is the idea that maybe there are people out there who have lots of skills, and maybe there are jobs that require lots of skills, but they're not matching up appropriately. At least I think that's the way I defined them uh, at the time. And as you say, when you, you use the term skills mismatch to describe either an oversupply of such people or an undersupply, is that right? Yeah, and I think the you know the interesting thing in the serious work on these topics is that the usual view is is not just in the U.S. And, but in Europe is that there has been a mismatch, uh, and the mismatch has been a, a pretty big oversupply of people who have at least the educational credentials to do the kind of jobs that we are thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, let's let's. Uh... Let's take these one by one. Let's start with the, uh, I guess, the most familiar part of the story is the story that says we just don't have enough. Uh, uh, our, our schools are, are are falling down on the job. They are not producing um, enough uh, uh, skilled workers to meet demand. And the, the way that's usually posed, uh, 
yep. is that we have a, a shortage of college graduates relative to demand. Yep. Um, you know, uh, arguments have been made that 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 uh, was true through the '90s. If I understand you correctly. You're saying it wasn't even true then, is that right? Yeah, it wasn't even uh, true then. I, I think maybe just to, to back up just a half a step um, in terms of thinking about what the kind of evidence is uh, mm -hmm. uh, from people who believe this uh, point of view. And the, uh, the evidence uh, has come from lots of um, employer anecdotes. Mm -hmm. And some of these are aggregated up into surveys of various quality. Um, but honestly, the surveys that have been done, I, I don't think the people who did them, their proprietary surveys typically done by employer groups, were expecting them to be particularly scientific. They were just sort of descriptive. Uh, and they ask employers whether they're having difficulty finding what they want. And the answers, you know, it's surprisingly high amount of people saying they have difficulty finding what they want. Uh, and that's it. That's been the evidence, that statement. And the first thing first leap of faith is the idea that we assume they're talking about jobs they're trying to fill with school leavers. And if you look at the data in the U.S., employers in the last couple of years have been filling about 5% of their jobs from college. So that means they're filling about 95% of their jobs from um, some from high school, but mainly they're hiring experienced people. That is, they want somebody with five years experience and they can't find what they want. So they're complaining about the inability to find people with the right set of work experience, people who've been out of the college scene for decades in some cases. So why we're assuming that these complaints were about school leavers is, you know, there's just no reason to assume it and lots of reason to assume that, that that's not what they're talking about. And mm -hmm. when you look at some of the surveys that actually talk about, they ask them about school leavers and what do you think there, you really don't see any evidence that they're complaining about a shortage of skills or academic ability. When they complain about school leavers, they complain about the things that older people always complain about younger people, and that's, you know, they're not responsible enough, they're not mature enough. It's not that those aren't real issues, but there's nothing particularly new about that. Right, right. Um, and uh, but even when you look at sort of the people who have, say, who are kind of recent graduates, and as I understand it, you're saying one of the fallacies is that there's a tendency to think of the, when you see these surveys, there's a tendency to think of the entire workforce as consisting of recent college graduates. When, right, when right. It doesn't. But yeah. even when you look at recent college graduates, um, uh, you know, in the 90s, we saw an increase in the um, college premium. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But that stopped, depending on who you ask, it stopped either... Uh, in the late 90s or, or uh, in, the, in the aughts. No one seems to dispute that we have not seen an increase right. uh, in um, uh, college wages uh, relative to uh, high school graduates yep. um, in, 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 in you know, at least 15 years. Yep. Um, yep. So can, can you talk about that a little? Sure, yeah, yeah. That's the other piece of information that, uh, that you hear on the more serious side and people a little more on the academic research side. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's important to begin with uh, what does that college premium really mean? And mm -hmm. I, I've just written a book about this topic called Will College Pay Off? Partly mm -hmm. because of this, so much attention given to that uh, college wage premium. What it is is the difference between what an average college educated or college degreed worker makes and the average high school degreed worker makes. Uh, and those average figures have to do, do with the average worker in the economy who's about age 46. So these, you know, average figure on average, people have been out of college or high school for 20 years or so, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's talking about what's been going on at that level. So there's no reason to think that that's what a new, that's the kind of premium that somebody graduating this year would make. It's, mm -hmm. you know, again, it's this average across the economy uh, and the new school leavers are a tiny part of that. But the other part uh, of that that's important to recognize is that gap did grow quite a bit. In the 1960s and early 70s, it was close to zero. That is, college grads didn't really make any more money than high school grads, which sounds mm -hmm. astonishing now, but apparently was true. Um, 
And the reason the gap grew is not because college grads are making any more money. It's because high school grads' wages declined sharply. And that's the decline of union jobs and manufacturing jobs that paid pretty well. It's mainly what, what drove that. So it used to be, used to be that uh, belonging to a union was the, uh, was the economic class. equivalent to having a BA. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I think that's right. And, and But there's a third part to that, too, uh, and that is that the assumption is that if you took a typical high school grad um, and you gave them a college degree, they would make what a typical college grad made. And that is that they're basically identical except for the degree. And we know that's not true. The kids who go on to college have a lot more going for them. They probably would have done better anyway. They have more family support. They have more money behind them. They probably have better academic ability. So. You know, the assumption that if you just had a college degree, you would make as much as a college worker uh, is not true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, very, very uh, discouraging conclusion. I, is your book out, incidentally? Is it yeah, a, yeah. It came out actually this week. So, Oh, uh, wonderful. And who is the timing. publisher? Uh, publisher is Public Affairs, part of Perseus uh, Group. Ah, great. Yes, I, I, I have... Uh, Published a couple of their great outfits. Oh, yeah. Published a couple yeah. of books with them uh, 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 myself. Um, but you know, uh, I think the the point you're raising is a is a profound one, and that is okay. So, <laughs> you know, the college degree doesn't pay off. Uh, the high school degree really doesn't pay off. Kind of, what do you do? Um, uh, doesn't that mean you really should pursue a college degree? The, the thing that is different now, I think, is that individuals have to pay so much for college degrees. So in the U.S. now, we pay seven times as much as uh, typical European or Western uh, countries pay per family to go to college. So we pay a ton more. Our graduation rates are the second worst in the industrialized world. And you really have to think about, will this investment pay off in the form of a return of some kind? So you could make more than a high school graduate and still not make enough money to pay off your student loans, which have gone up 150% in the last 10 years or so. And that's, I think, the real dilemma. Yeah, sure, it's, it's better to have a college degree than a high school degree. That's, that's very clear. Nobody disputes that. Um, the question is, is it worth the amount of money you might have to pay to get the college degree? Because increasingly, you know, we're expecting individuals to pay for it. And that's quite a different question. And the answer to that's not so obvious. So, for example, let, let, let's do a little role playing here. Okay. I am a 17 year old uh, uh, middling student from uh, a uh, uh, middle to low uh, income family. Um, I don't know, uh, Professor Capelli, should I go to college? Well, I'd say the first thing you can do, and, and there are actually little calculators that UCLA puts out uh, to estimate the odds that you will graduate and graduate on time. So only 40% of full-time students in the U.S. graduate on time in four years. So if you're the, thinking... The worst outcome of all is to not graduate and, and to get the debt without the degree. That's, that's Absolutely. Uh, that's terrible. And by the way, you know, in case anybody doesn't know, if you take out those loans and you don't graduate, you still have to pay them back. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it takes six years to graduate, uh, even if you do graduate, the cost of that education is, you know, dramatically higher. So I'd say the first thing, if you're a parent, think about your own kid is, do I think my kid is mature enough to graduate? Do they have the kind of um, experience so far that demonstrates that they're going to be able to get out in some reasonable period of time and actually graduate? And that's also something that varies astonishingly across schools. The graduation rates are stunningly different depending where you go. And some part of that has to do with how much effort the colleges put into trying to get the kids out on time. And basically, the short answer is the more expensive schools seem to spend more money trying to get you out on time. Here's a quick anecdote. In our part of the world, Penn State, which is the most elite state university in probably in this part of the world, not just in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, uh, has a graduation rate on time of 65%. And the University of Pennsylvania, where I am, which is you know much more expensive school more elite as well probably but mm -hmm. the students i don't think are terribly different we have a 98 percent graduation rate in four years mm -hmm. so if you're going to pen you know the uh the odds that you get out in four years which is much cheaper are much greater and that's something you ought to pay some attention to 
and how does Penn sort of make sure that you uh, graduate um, more quickly? Yeah, and that's a great question, and I, and I think we we have a pretty good sense of that. Uh, and here are some of the ways. And the first one is getting your majors completed on time. So one of the most preventable problems that causes kids to not finish on time is they can't get the courses that they need to complete majors, especially when they change majors, as students often do. Mm -hmm. um, and you can look at a major and tell how likely it is that you won't be able to finish it by looking at how complicated it is. And mm -hmm. the biggest complications are needing to take courses in a particular order. Because if anything happens to any of the courses in that order, it's going to be very difficult to, to get that major done. So, Are you, you know, saying the, there's stricter supervision of that at, at, at Penn than there, there would th be at, at a uh, less expensive school? I think some of it is having the resources to make sure that there's always somebody there who can teach the course. Mm -hmm. So if somebody goes on sabbatical, the course doesn't just sit empty for a year until that person comes back. And some of it is, yeah, I think stricter discipline, paying more attention to whether these majors are you know, too complicated and whether kids are getting hung up, unable to graduate. And if they are, there's a lot of pressure on the schools to find some way to offer the course to make sure that the kids can get out. And the other way is a lot of support, a lot of counseling, a lot of tutoring, a lot of special programs for kids who are struggling. Now, uh, another dimension of this seems to be that um, uh, uh, there's a bit of inflation in terms of um, what employers require from employees when you have uh, a labor market like the one we've got right now, which isn't particularly right. tight. And you know, we, we've all right. seen stories about <clears throat> star, you know, all these Starbucks baristas with, with BAs, and yep. um, uh, it seems as though what Starbucks is doing is, is using the BA as a kind of filter, as a sort of proxy for is this person responsible? It, it really doesn't have anything to do with skills because uh, right. a high school dropout should have no difficulty uh, mastering skills uh, required of a Starbucks barista. Um, right. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that's certainly true. There was a study done at uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, that found that the majority of parking lot attendants have been to college. They didn't necessarily graduate, but they've been to college. Wow. And, you know, I think what happens is if you're an employer and you got tons of people applying and you can be picky, well, you ought to be picky. It's not, you know, it's not their fault for doing it. It makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the problem then, though, is uh, those some of those, you know, uh, decisions become requirements. So for example, in the field of law, legal secretaries now more or less are required to have a college degree and they never were required to have that before the Great Recession. Why did that happen? Well, there are so many people wanted to be legal secretaries relative to the demand that they could be picky and then that becomes a job requirement. And we know that during downturns, job requirements rise. And then after they rise, back to the skills gap question, then an employer might very well find, as the economy picks up, that they can't find enough people with college degrees to do the legal secretary work anymore. Now, is that a skill shortage? Uh, I don't think so. Is it a skill gap? It's That's not a skill gap. Um, sort of an expectation and, sort of situation. Yeah, it's an expectations problem. And, you know, when one of the things that we expect happens, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things we expect should happen is that markets adjust and both uh, workers and employers have to adjust to them. So workers get used to making less money or maybe having to work harder or take jobs that are not as attractive in downturns and employers get used to paying more and getting less picky in upturns. And some people suggest that at least some of the employer complaints have been um, and actually the, some of the employers admitted in the surveys that they can't get people to take jobs at the wages they're offering, which is, you know, no skill problem. It's just a cheapness problem. Well, let me take the, the, up the employer's case here for a moment sure. and uh, um, uh, sort of posit one hypothesis, which is that, um, uh, that co a college degree today uh, is the equivalent of, uh, you know, a high school degree two or three generations ago. I mean, I think we've all seen these um, tests that uh, get administered even to kids in uh, grammar school, say, in the early part of the 20th century, and, and they can sort of take your breath away. You suddenly realize, my goodness, there was um, 
a, a even a grammar school education was more rigorous at the start of the 20th century uh, than it is today. My own grandfather was a foreman in a factory, uh, had an eighth grade education, and he always struck me as being about as well educated as mm. uh, as any college graduate uh, or at least high school graduate that I I knew. Um, so, what would you say if an employer were to say, well? Um, the reason we have this inflation in, in, in the degrees we require is because uh, kids come out of college. You, if, if you want employees to have the skills that they used to have when they graduated from high school, now you can't get them coming out of high school. You have to get them yeah. coming out of college. Well, I mean, this is one of these great myths that, you know, that schools are failing and that they're doing worse. Actually, the evidence is pretty clear that that's just not true, that uh, student achievement did slide in the 1970s, but since about 1981, it's more or less held its own and slowly climbed back up. So student achievement in the standardized tests that matter the most, that, that uh, assess student achievement in particular courses, reading and math in particular, suggests that it's been going up pretty steadily and dropout rates have been declining, depending, depending how you measure them by a lot or a little, but the trend is clearly up. So it's simply not the case that students from high school used to know more than they do now. In fact, every once in a while, you'll see one of these shock stories about, you know, kids, 40% of kids not knowing where Miami is, for example. I saw one of those mm -hmm. a little while ago, and it was, uh, it was done in 1941. Right. So I think the idea that kids kids today don't know as much as kids used to do is is simply false. And there's, that, there's that's no a, evidence. that's one of those striking things in your paper is you say we don't. It's true we don't rank very well internationally, but yeah. then again we never did. We never did, right? Uh, so I I think uh, you know it's another one of those myths, and I think this is a cognitive bias that happens when you hear things over and over and over, like schools are failing. We hear this all the time, and everybody believes that you know, across the country schools are failing, and there certainly are schools that are doing terribly, and um, we can certainly argue that schools are not doing well enough, uh, but the idea that they're getting worse on some objective scale is, you know, is not true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, I, 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 one uh, sort of book that um, I was very sort of taken with, I have a feeling you would disagree with it, um, was uh, uh, Golden and Katz's The Race Between Technology and Education, where they basically argue that through the 20th century, we've seen steadily rising skill demands uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the, uh, the workforce, and that until the 70s, education levels were rising to meet them consistently, and they stopped rising in uh, the 70s relative to demand. What's, what's your thought about that thesis? Uh, well, I think their, their book, which is a, you know, a sort of grand sweep of, of history, certainly, mm -hmm. you know, the general uh, thesis in this seem to have a lot of support for it. I think if you're talking about w when does the sweep stop, <laughs> you know, which mm -hmm. in some ways is kind of, when does the data uh, that, that's used stop? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't cover the most recent period. So there's an, an interesting study done by a couple of sociologists who looked at uh, a cross section of the uh, workforce of the economy, employees in 1970, looked at the jobs they had, went to the Bureau of uh, or Department of Labor's website that describes what jobs require in considerable detail. And it's something that's updated over time and compared that to a cross section of workers today. And mm -hmm. so the question is, how have skills, skill requirements and jobs changed in the workforce, which is really, you know, sort of how have either people changed jobs in such a way that there are more people in jobs that are higher skilled, or is it the case that people in the same job title now, those jobs require more? And the evidence is kind of overwhelming that it's the differences are trivial. I mean, they're, mm. you know, up a couple of percentage points, maybe. Interesting, um, and that's it. I mean, there's no well, some some forms these... of technology have actually lowered skill requirements, right? Sure, yeah. The well, if you think about cash register, you know, where you had to be able to add and subtract, right, uh, which right. which stopped being true uh, quite a long time ago. I mean, I, I, yeah, when I was I in college, I had one of those jobs where you had to use one of those old-fashioned NCR cash registers, and uh, um, within I think three or four years of my having that job, they had machines that did the yep. adding and subtracting for you. 
I think that's a great point that we confuse the sophistication of the technology with the skills required to use it. Uh, and there are, you know, like like cars today, right, are incredibly sophisticated to uh, to build these things and full of little computers. Um, servicing them may not necessarily be all that harder now. It might be simpler. You plug them in and up on the screen, the software tells you what's wrong with the car and what chip to replace and off you go. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's this distinction between technology, which is getting more complicated. And, you know, the skills to create that technology might be incredibly high, but there's not very many of those people. And if you look across a workforce of 160 million people, the skill requirements don't seem to be going up very much. Well, before <clears throat> before we leave the education realm, I'd like to, to sort of bring up the question of uh, something that's been in the news lately, which is H-1B visas. Um, yep, yep. We've seen really uh, uh, alarming stories uh, about both Southern California Edison and Disney World in recent yep. Yep. Um, weeks. And uh, the stories in both seem to be about the same. You saw um, uh, companies firing uh, a bunch of uh, 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 data. Uh, uh, workers uh, uh, and um, replacing them with H-1B workers who then the, the, the laid off workers actually as a condition of receiving severance had to train, right. which does call into question the idea that American workers lack the necessarily, uh, necessary skills for these jobs. Right. Now the right. law says that you're not supposed to be allowed to do that, but there is a gigantic loophole that says this if if i yeah if i fire joe and replace him with sam and sam is an hb worker that's against the law if i fire joe and i uh say i'm going to be contracting this work out in the future to x company and right. x hires sam the h1b right. worker that right. is perfectly legal right, right. um what are your thoughts about this h1b yeah business? yeah no i think that i think that's right and and i think the 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 problem for employers who feel under incredible pressure to cut costs and improve their profitability is that they feel the need, I think, understandably, to press on every possible way of cutting costs. And I, I think, you know, we can't expect them really not to do that. Uh, but then that means that if, if we accept that, that we have to draw pretty tight boundaries around um, what is permissible and what is not. And, you know, the evidence on H-1B visas has never been particularly sanguine. You know, it's the average H-1B visa person is not somebody who is a whiz-bang IT person. They tend to be sort of middle-of-the-road IT people. And for employers, one of the things that you know, folks might not know about H-1B visa people is that pretty much they can't quit. So, I mean, they do have to be paid what U.S. workers are paid, and I think there's evidence that they are, but they can't quit. Because if you quit, the company that sponsored you to go to come into the U.S., more or less, you're required to go back to your home country. Um, and if you're here and you you came from a country where wages are substantially lower, um, this is a great job and you're likely to work much harder at it because you are really paid well. This is a terrific opportunity and you don't want to be sent home. So and I would imagine if you're cutting certain costs on you know, sort of wage regulations like overtime regulations, the H-1B worker would be a lot less likely to call you on it. Right? Yeah, who can, you know, who, who's going to complain, right? Uh, which I think is, th that's certainly a problem as well. But just in general, it is a whole lot easier to manage people who can't quit and want to stay on their job because it beats the heck out of what their alternatives are. I mean, that's one of the reasons why in downturns it's easy to raise productivity. You know, people are just glad to have jobs. So if that's your alternative, it's not the least bit surprising why employers are going to try to find ways to use them. So I, th I think it's kind of incumbent on the on the government and the political system to say, look, we can't fudge this any longer. The law says that you're only supposed to be able to do this if you can't find these workers. And it's, you know, it's pretty well known that this stuff goes on all the time. And, you know, it's pretty well known that there are ways in which you can spin your case uh, that drastically improve the odds that you're going to get permission to use these workers. Um, even if the facts on the ground don't particularly support the law. So 
you know, I think it's another, it's, and it's not only H1B, there's lots of uh, examples like this, some of them about classifying work, for example, turning people into exempt workers so you don't have to pay them overtime, uh, where there's a sort of constant push uh, to see where the boundary is, and if you don't enforce the boundary, then, you know, we fall right over it. And uh, this this uh, kind of gets us into the whole sort of STEM uh, shortage, uh, yeah, which yeah. may also not exist. I think you argue right. that it does not exist. Uh, you know, one concrete example I wrote about a few years ago when I was working at the New Republic were all these school teachers who were being hired through a what purported to be, I think, a cultural exchange program through the State Department, mm. uh, mm -hmm. where superintendents of schools would go over to the Philippines to recruit school teachers, STEM teachers. The Philippines, incidentally, on international uh, comparisons, uh, uh, doesn't rank particularly high with regard to STEM skills. Where it, where it, uh, what makes it appealing is that um, uh, it's a low wage country where a lot of people right. speak English. Um, so a lot of these folks got recruited by these uh, uh, public schools around the country. They came to the United States. Um, they in many there were many scandals uh, concerning their treatment and. Uh, um, several programs, for example, one in uh, PG, uh, Prince George's County in Maryland, uh, near where I live, uh, got shut down. Is that is that a story you followed at all? Uh, I hadn't followed that one per se, but you can you can certainly see why it uh, you know why it happens uh, you know because because they're cheaper, uh, and the same thing happened with the Philippine employees um, with nurses, right? So for mm -hmm. a long time we had. Uh, perceived nursing shortage in, in the U.S. And the reason, in retrospect, we had the nursing shortage was partly because, uh, at least on the East Coast, it was pretty easy to bring in nurses from the Philippines who we didn't have to pay as much because they were delighted to be here compared to the alternatives they saw in the job market in the Philippines. And that actually kept the wages from, from going up. Now, at the moment, uh, you know, there appears to be a pretty good surplus of nurses. And by surplus, I mean people who have the credentials to be nurses who can't get jobs. Uh, there's some anecdotal evidence that some of the nursing schools are only placing about half their graduates now. And the biggest nurse, uh, the biggest employer of nurses in the U.S., uh, Hospital Corp of America, recently announced that they are no longer hiring nurses who don't have experience already. And a couple of their big competitors followed suit and said the yeah. same thing. And that is because, you know, frankly, they don't have to. You can hire enough nurses now who've already got experience and you don't have to train them and pay for additional skills for them. So, you know, I think you can distort the market uh, with some of these things like H-1B visas and like the earlier program to bring in apparently teachers and nurses. So the market never adjusts and then wages don't go up. People don't go into the to the jobs, and there you are. Um, well, let's let's. Uh, we've talked a lot about education now. Let's talk about the the other category you addressed in your article, which is whether people have the. Uh, it's not so much the sort of educational background as the particular skills associated with a particular job. Yeah. And you argue that um, uh, that, that uh, businesses are less willing to provide the necessary training for those jobs. Yeah. Yeah. and that they are uh, basically acting somewhat petulantly about workers not having the skills that, that really they ought to be teaching the workers themselves. Is that a correct summary of what you say? Yes, uh, and I think, you know, you might want to test this yourself and viewers might want to test this to go to some site like Monster Career Builder or something where you can look at lots of job ads and pick a job that, you know, you hear a lot about there not being enough people to do it and see what they require, what they're looking for. And what they're looking for in almost every case I've seen is a lot of experience. And what they want are the kind of experiences with work that allow you to step right into that job and immediately start making a contribution, which is perfectly understandable. I, I would want the same thing. The problem is uh, a generation ago, and I think particularly for smaller employers, they could poach people away from the bigger employers that provided training. So you didn't have to train yourself, you could just hire some people away. Mm -hmm. But then you started to see lots of employers doing the same thing. 
and and not training new hire workers but just relying on hiring people from your competitors well you can only do that for so long and then you got a problem there's a the new paper that's coming out uh, shortly that looks at employer provided training um, over time and sh sees a sharp decline in the training about 2001 um, which continues on to the data stop that they used 2009 I'm sure it's not going up a lot now and at the same time apprentice programs collapse can, can, can I interrupt for a second whose, whose paper is that and, uh, well is, is it, it's a... appearing in the in the journal ILR review and I, I can't say I know the author because I mm -hmm. was a referee and they don't tell you but I, I, know, okay. the, <laughs> I know the paper has been accepted and and uh, it's going to appear shortly and as um, long as we're doing citations I neglected to ask you and they, they will want to post that uh, a blogging head uh, who were the sociologists who did that study you mentioned earlier comparing skill requirements uh, from the 70s and today? Yeah, I will have to uh, look that one up uh, just to remember exactly who the authors were, but it's in oh, okay. the American Journal of Sociology about two years ago. Um, okay. And maybe afterwards I can uh, I can send you the citations for that. It's also in the both the book and the article that uh, that, that you read. It's, it's in those. Okay, great. Um, uh, so, well, um, uh, uh, so uh, employers don't want to provide this training. They got used yep. to poaching from other people. What do they do yep. now when there's no one to poach from? <laughs> well, I think that's, uh, that's a big question. And I think that's one of the big challenges in the economy. Everybody wants somebody with three to five years experience and nobody wants to give new kids that experience. And, you know, on the blue collar side, registered apprenticeships, which, you know, you associate with unions and crafts and the serious mm -hmm. apprentice programs, collapsed, fell by about half in the 2000s. Uh, and at the same time, we also saw sharp declines in vocational education, which is another story. And that is if you were an employer who before, maybe you did provide some training, but you could hire a kid out of high school who's spent some time learning hands-on vocational skills, those programs are down, and a lot of that has been not student demand. It's been within the schools themselves. They decided that maybe those were dead end careers, and so they they cut back on them. And the extent to which you need uh, that you you find skills these days, where you could go someplace and get some of those skills, it's probably community colleges. So, mm -hmm. you know what that means, unfortunately, is that kids have to wait until after high school and pay for it themselves you know it may not be tons of money in absolute terms but if you're poor it's a lot of money to go to community college and get the kind of coursework that might allow some employer who was willing to give somebody some experience uh, an opportunity so we're getting pinched on all sides here you know the voc ed is gone apprenticeships are down partly because unions are down employers are getting pickier and may have to back off that but also they're getting reluctant to train because they almost all say now, if I train you, I'm going to lose you, and why should I train you as a result? By the way, it's not clear that that's true, but it's widely believed, and frankly, in a lot of circumstances, it's more <laughs> what people believe is more important than the, than the reality. So it's a nasty circumstance for young people trying to get into the labor, for, labor force. And I, I, I've heard tell, I have not reported this out, but I have been told that um, one problem with getting training from a community college is that they don't really sort of track what happens to their students after they leave. So they yeah. don't have a great feedback loop uh, that tells them, you know, this skill is yeah. still in demand, that skill is no longer in demand, and so forth. Right, that's a big problem, and it's not just true of community colleges. It's true of four-year colleges as well, and it's very—it is frankly kind of difficult to find your graduates. They, you got to ask them, uh, write to them if you know their address, and they don't always follow, correspond, and sometimes they don't reply. And this is one of the problems that I worried about in in my book: is uh, uh, will college pay off? Is how do you know whether a college will really get you a job, and they're quite specific uh, degree programs, things like bakery science and turf management and these actual degree majors that have names like that, because they don't even know what proportion of their graduates have jobs. So it's, you know, it makes it very complicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, uh, you know, this has been a, a fascinating conversation. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, delighted to know that you have a new book out on this topic as well. Um, 
uh, thank you so much for um, for uh, entertaining my questions on this. It's, no, uh, thank I've you. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed our conversation. So uh, we're signing off uh, from Logging Heads.